Okay. Um, uh, just hello. <laughs> I want to continue with Peter here and uh, praying that the Lord just refreshes everybody today. I, I feel like um, just taking the survey, so to speak, people are, there's been a lot of attacks in people's personal lives, um, sort of like a war of attrition, little things just wearing them down. And uh, I can sense like a sluggishness in the air. And usually that's not just you feeling that. You find out that you are members of one another and when one suffers, we all suffer. And you'll find it ripple through the fellowships, you know, that everybody's kind of experiencing the same thing. Don't think you're alone. Uh, we groan together. We go through dryness together. We go through uh, feelings of, you know, not being clear together. Uh, and I don't know that it's necessarily the whole body of Christ, but definitely in a fellowship, um, you'll see it. And I guess we, because we affect each other, you know, but the Lord has us in his hand. And if there's anything I've learned throughout this whole thing is that he is faithful to raise us up. And, uh, you know, I've used this example a few times where um, resurrection life, which is the life we received, it is resurrection, and it is Christ himself. Uh, when we believed the gospel, we received, we were regenerated. We received Christ, his life, which death cannot hold, corruption cannot hold, nothing can hold it. And there was a pastor who gave me an example early on in my Christian life that has stuck with me that resurrection life is like a, like a buoy. Um, a buoy in the, uh, always rises to the top. It always sits on the top of the water. And when you push that buoy down under the water, the, the, to the degree that you put pressure on it to push it down, the further down you push it in that exact way, if not more, it'll respond by springing back up to the surface when you let go. And so the more pressure you put on it, the higher it lifts off, um, if you can imagine pushing a buoy under the water and then letting go and watching it spring up to the surface. That's resurrection life in us. That's Christ. He's that faithful. And what we think is long is very short to the Lord. Um, the Lord is used to dealing with long time frames to work in people's lives. You know, we were designed to live a lot longer than we live. After the flood, the lifespan started dwindling. But even uh, Terah, Abraham's father, was, I think, 200-something uh, when he died. Uh, people were living hundreds of years, and God was dealing with them in periods and seasons that lasted decades. So we think, man, I've been dry for, the, for like a week. <laughs> Really? <laughs> you know, uh, but things are accelerated for us because we have the resurrection life and God is faithful and, you know, everything, uh, is for, is, is for your good. If you're a believer and everything is working in your life to prove your faith. And to that it will, and it will be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ because it's it's more precious than gold that perishes. It's one of the four incorruptible things in this chapter. And you talk about the trying of your faith. You know, what is faith? Well, we walk by what we do not see. Um, it's the assurance of things unseen, and that means includes our feelings. You know, it really comes down to. The obedience of faith is acknowledging what is true based on what God has described in his word apart from my feelings, even if it contradicts my feelings. When you feel condemned, what is your answer? Is it to wallow in the condemnation? No, it is to acknowledge that you have a savior and that there's no condemnation in Christ and that you're in Christ and that your sins are under the blood and you have access and you're told to approach God boldly by the throne of, um, uh, to receive grace. 
approach the throne of grace with boldness to receive grace and find mercy to help in the time of need. Um, and when we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who himself is the propitiation for our sins. And we, the only way, only way to clear the air between you and God when you are loaded with condemnation, for example, is to acknowledge these things as true and believe them and approach on the basis of them. If you don't, a lot of people never even get that far. And that's why they spend their entire Christian life as babies, uh, never growing beyond just the bare rudiments of, am I really even saved? You know, that's why they have to listen to the same arguments again and again and again and again about eternal security. It's because they don't know how to deal with their conscience by acknowledging what's true in spite of what they feel. And I've been there for years, too. When I say they, I mean we, you know. Uh, but eventually, we have to grow strong in faith. Not consider, like, like Abraham, not considering his own body is so dead, or the barrenness of Sarah's womb, but waxing strong in faith and giving glory to God. Um, he was firmly persuaded that what God had said he would do. And that God is the one who calls those things that are not as though they are, and gives life to the dead. You know, and he says that I can approach boldly, no matter what my condition is, because I have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for my sins. I have an offering. And he doesn't receive me on the basis of myself. He receives me on the basis of the offering. Uh, just like a priest of the Old Testament. It didn't matter what kind of life they had. What mattered was were they clothed in the priest priestly garment and did they have the right offering uh, as far as the priests go and we are priests and we have an offering that's already been offered Jesus Christ and our obedience is consists as we've been talking about of coming forward based on the knowledge of the truth acknowledging that offering and that means we're sprinkled with his blood and we're clean that's the only way to deal with sin uh, there's no other way. You don't have a remedy for sin. What can cleanse my, you know, these spots? <laughs> Sorry, that's from Hamlet. <laughs> that's not the Bible. But, uh, you know, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is the only answer for your sin. And last night I was meditating a little bit on the way to bed about uh, the cross. And that we are crucified with Christ. And I think about sometimes how we don't believe we deserve to be there. <laughs> we think we are mostly good, and uh, but not perfect. And Jesus had to die for us because we're not perfect. No, if you want to understand the depth of your depravity, you need to look at the cross because the cross is the display. Not only of God's love and his righteousness, but the depth of how ruined you are. Because that cross is rightfully yours. That's your real portion. If it weren't for Christ. But he is there instead of us. You know. And then we are reckoned as crucified with him. But it's really that bad. And so. When you sin. You have not surprised God. Nor have we. As many people think. Grieved the spirit. Oh now he's sad because you sinned. No he's not. He has anticipated it at all. He has anticipated it all. In the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He is the propitiation for our sins. And not only ours. But the whole world. He came to save sinners. He was manifested. To deal with sin. Uh that was his mission so no he's not surprised when he finds that the cancer patient is actually sick and has symptoms or gr or grieve because he has the solution he has the remedy he would grieve if there was no cure he would grieve if there was no remedy and you were just there to perish but you're not you have a fountain of living water that is the healing for every part every ailment you know jesus christ if you believe in him he is in your spirit and he can spring up and wash you, and you can come forward to be him and be, come forward to him and be cleansed. 
But sometimes we need to think, realize how bad it is, you know. And it's bad. <laughs> it's not just that you messed up a little bit. No, you are hopelessly ruined apart from Christ. So the more you realize that, the more you will give up on any disappoint, you know, any any hope in bringing some kind of righteousness to God that's going to change his mind towards you or deal with the feelings of condemnation that you have. No, the, the way we deal with the feelings of condemnation is by looking away from ourselves and stopping. No, no, no attempt to repair ourselves. No attempt to bring it anything other than the blood of Jesus Christ. But then as we do, we come forward through the blood, we're cleansed. If we do it by faith, you know, and it really comes down to what do you believe and acknowledging, I believe, even though now we st I started talking about dryness, even though I feel dry, uh, that's not what I go by. I cannot measure my condition based on my feeling. I have to, I have to measure what is true in terms of what has God given me and provided, and is it enough? Yes, it is. He says I'm clean. And on the basis of the blood, I'm allowed to come forward and enjoy his presence. You say, well, I don't feel his presence. Stop it. <laughs> uh, don't measure based on your feeling. Say amen to what is true and thank God for it in spite of what you feel. That is the answer. We learn eventually to not be slave to our feelings. If you're a slave to your feeling, you'll be a slave to sin. You'll be a slave to every appetite. You'll be a slave to everything. But we've been delivered from slavery. And we the only way for us to participate in the freedom we have is to learn to acknowledge by faith what Christ has done for us and to come forward on the basis of that faith. Come forward to God. Come boldly to him. He says, I take pleasure, no pleasure in those who shrink back. Right? And we're told to come boldly. Boldly means loud. Loudly into his presence. We have a right to be there because of the blood. We are heirs. Not ever because of our own works. Not because of our own history. It's because of faith in the blood. It brings us in. And that's where the cleansing power is. Not outside of that. So that's why so many people stay babies. Is because they stay in their feelings and they never move on to say, okay, I don't care what I feel. I've got to look at what the Bible says and true. And then I've got to ask myself, do I believe it? And if so, what am I doing with this? And our obedience, again, is to come near. It's the obedience of faith. And we are obedient children because we believe. And now we need to continue in our faith. As you receive the Lord, so walk in him. Uh, you know, we received him by faith, we walk by faith. Faith means not what I see, not what I feel, but what the word tells me, period. It's, and, you know, and it can be really dry feeling. And I, I'll admit, I'm just as much an addict to the feelings as well. You know, my feelings have said for about two weeks now, you are dry. Wow, this is really dry. You know, you, you just don't have much of a appetite well i'm not justified by my appetite I'm justified by the blood um i've got to discount those feelings and ignore them if i'm gonna uh because it's just the enemy's way of trapping your mind and to thinking that you are limited by your condition and that your feeling determines what today is going to look like no his mercies are new every day and we're told to be renewed and, you know, a lot of people pray for revival. Oh, we need a revival. No, we need to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. That's what the New Testament talks about. You know, Paul didn't talk about renewal as if it was something that was unattainable and came in seasons and may happen, you know. No, uh, renewal means you are setting your mind on what is true, setting your mind on the spirit, putting on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him who created him. And real revivals in church history have come out of some people being renewed. It just means that there is a renewed focus on the truth and on his mercies and on his grace and on his great salvation, 
which is true every day. If people have fallen into religiosity, formality, and deadness, it's because of a failure to be renewed. It's because they've deviated eventually from the truth, which is the spring of life. You know, Christ is the Word. He comes to us through the Word. That's how He's chosen to come to us. And then the Spirit bears witness to the Word. Uh, I had to block somebody on my channel, unfortunately. Uh, I, usually they say supportive things, but there's always like a cry cryptic element. And uh, so they were like, uh, you know, folks, this last comment was, folks, don't, don't limit the Word to just the Scriptures. It's... Christ is so far beyond the word, you know. Well, that in a way is true in that the word is what he's revealed so far, but that's what he's that's how he's chosen to reveal himself. He's chosen to reveal himself as in the word. And if you say, well, Jesus operates beyond the word, then what are you going to measure those things that you encounter that you think are him beyond the word. You've got nothing to measure him by. Now he's righteous. He's not going to go beyond his word. And his word is is our window into what's true in him. That he doesn't he didn't give us another window. And then the spirit bears witness to the word. Uh so eventually I had to hide the guy because I can't have that kind of love and influencing other people. On the channel and I do hide people from time to time for those kind of reasons um, they don't they don't come across as nefarious but it's 11 you know and it's a it's and, and I'm not gonna debate with them on the law that when they're that uh, strong in what they believe I just have to suppress it <laughs> so anyway uh, no we, we walk by faith and our faith is the content of our faith is in the scripture. There's not something else to believe. Otherwise, you're just dealing entirely in the realm of the senses. Um, let's see. Uh, so anyway, we're talking about the trial of our faith, right? And uh, that's, that's what Peter's about to talk about. We've been regenerated unto an inheritance incorruptible, which is a living hope, and that is described in the word. Um... And we're kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And that salvation is described in the word. And in that, you greatly rejoice. In what? Well, I guess in the living hope, the inheritance, and the salvation to be ready to be revealed in the last time. In, in that, you greatly rejoice. So we know our destination. We know our end. But... It's not just that we rejoice in the future, because he's going to say that Christ is the one we come to rejoice in, and he's a present person. He's with us now. Um, but anyway, he says, where do you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. So that's common. You know, that's something we go through. Uh, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold which perishes though it be tried by fire may be found under praise and honor and glory at the appearing of jesus christ now most people interpret this like you are being tested to see whether you really believe that's not it you are brought through various temptations and 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 you have a feeling of heaviness when you are going through these things and they are sovereignly allowed by god and, you know, Job being the the pattern, we know that Satan, the accuser, stands before God night and day. And he says, you know, consider, God says, consider my servant, Job, you know. And Satan's like, yeah, but he's only trusting you for the blessings. What if we take those away or whatever? No, he's not going to move. In a way, we are, we are similarly tested. Okay. And God's the one on trial. And it's really about, does he preserve his own? And he does. Okay. And we've received in second Peter, it says we've received like precious faith with the apostles. We've received a faith on the one hand, we believe the gospel, but when we did, we received the faith. Jude said we had to contend once and for all for the faith that has been delivered or contend for the faith that's been delivered once for all. 
right? The faith has been delivered to us and we've received it and it is imperishable. It is the incorruptible seed of the word of God that regenerated us. That is the faith. Okay, we're kept by the power of God through faith unto a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. And we rejoice in the living hope unto which we were regenerated. We rejoice in our inheritance, which is incorruptible. Incorruptible. Okay, we've been regenerated by the seed of the incorruptible, the incorruptible seed of the word of God, too. We've received the incorruptible life that will always come to the top like that buoy. It's incorruptible. Death cannot hold it. It cannot be corrupted. It can't be soiled. It can't be sullied. And that's our life. And it's Christ himself. And he's the one that's really being tried. And we go through these seasons of heaviness, which is what I'm kind of describing. And we go, where, where am I? And where is God? You know, um, but through that, the Lord brings us back our attention back to the faith in which we rejoice. We're rejoicing not in our feelings. We're rejoicing in the truth. He's saying, look, you rejoice, and yet you have heaviness through t manifold temptations. Are both possible? Yeah, apparently. At the same time you're experiencing heaviness, you also can rejoice in the, in the truth. Um. And as you do, your faith is being put on display and it's being revealed as more precious than gold that perishes. In other words, it's incorruptible and tr it can be tried by fire, but it can't be t tampered with. It can't be destroyed. If anything, it's just refined and shines more brightly. It's being proved. It's the proving of your faith. Uh, this says the trial of your faith, but some translations say the proving of your faith. You know, it it is a demonstration of the incorruptibility of your faith that does not perish. Um, so you go through do, these different things, but that faith is going to be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He said, well, I find faith in the earth. Well, he's going to find faith in me. I know that. How do I know that? Because it's already in me and it's incorruptible. And I'm kept by the power of God through that faith. And I received it. It's a precious faith. And it was once and for all delivered, and I believed it. I believed the gospel, and I received the faith. And so I know I'm kept. And I know that that faith will be found to praise and honor and glory, even though I go through seasons of just absolute dryness. I believe the Lord is coming soon. And I believe there's a refreshing before his coming. But that refreshing is going to come through the acknowledgement of the truth. It's going to be by faith. And that faith is what's going to be found. Not us found it glory for him, but our faith found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Faith is everything. That's our obedience. That is what we are doing. What are we doing? We're believing the truth. Um, and then he says... So it'll be found in the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, or the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, in whom though you've not seen him, yet believing, there it is, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Okay, so on the one hand, there's a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And there's the appearing of Jesus Christ. And there's an incorruptible inheritance, a living hope. That sounds future. It is future. But at the same time, the trying of our faith brings us to the present Christ. Really, what, what is faith for? It's, for? it's your eyes to see Christ. The way we see him is through the knowledge of the truth. Okay, But when we act on that truth and come forward to him with boldness and say, no matter what I feel, Lord, I believe in you, he becomes precious to us. And even though we've not seen him, we find that we love him. And that love is supplied by him as God sheds abroad his love in our heart by the Holy Spirit, which is also related to the living hope. Romans 5 says, this hope, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, and this hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit, which he's given to us. The love of God in our hearts really comes from the full understanding that we are safe in him, we are kept in him, and we can boast in the, in the hope of the glory of God through faith, knowing that that hope will not disappoint. 
And Hebrews calls this hope, the living hope, an anchor for our soul that brings us into the presence within the veil. It brings us into God's presence when we, when we meditate on the things that have been revealed as our hope, our inheritance, what's in store for us, which are all in Christ. And we find out that he's keeping us and he's supplying us and he's our life and he's our inheritance and he's our treasure and he's our beloved and we're accepted in him and in him we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins and we are chosen in him and foreknown in him and blessed in him everything we have everything because of him he's our tabernacle he's our meeting place with god we have boldness to approach god as sons and heirs co-heirs with christ because of jesus christ and as we learn how christ dependent everything is we rejoice in him and we love him and see, that's what the faith is. The faith is the acknowledgement that it's not on me, it's on him. That's really what it comes down to. Even when I was talking about condemnation, what, is, what, what does it mean to, to look to him as my propitiation, my advocate with the Father, and to know that I have an offering and know that I can come boldly on the basis of his blood? What I'm saying is it's not about me, it's about him. I'm exchanging my righteousness, which is filthy rags, and my condemnation and my fears and my hopelessness and my sin for the white garment he's purchased for me with his blood. And I'm putting it on by faith and saying, no, I'm the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. I have no, I have no condemnation in him. I'm spotless in God's eyes. I've been presented in the body of his flesh through death without blemish i'm holy and without blemish before the father in, in in christ and in love i'm his beloved child and i'm cleansed by the blood and i'm clean in christ and my righteousness is a spectacular garment before god that the angels can see you know like in zechariah when the priest joshua as a type of christ is wearing our soiled garments and then he has to take those off and put on the spectacular garments of his priesthood and his crown. That's what we do. We exchange our filthiness for what is true in Christ, and it's all because of him. And the more we do that, and we get satisfied, and our conscience is satisfied, and the feelings of condemnation and heaviness get rolled off, what's happening is we are learning Christ. And we're learning how precious he is, and how available he is, and how real he is. And our faith is being found to praise and honor and glory at his revelation. And we're learning to rejoice in him. We're, we're starting to rejoice in this one we haven't even seen. And he's going to say, okay, and re we receive the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. What is that salvation? You're saved from the feelings of the heaviness and you're saved from the condemnation. and You're saved from the despair and being totally locked into yourself and limited by what you feel and you're saved unto christ being magnified in your body it's the same thing paul said in in philippians this shall turn out to me for salvation through your petition and the bountiful supply of the spirit of jesus christ that as always even now with all boldness christ will be magnified in my body whether through life or through death for to me to live is christ it's to live christ it's christ being magnified in me in this present time and it's sometimes through heaviness and temptations that it's brought out. You know, if God allows a season in your life that's dry or heavy, it's because he wants to bring you kind of hungry and thirsty for, to Christ. Because the hungry he fills, but the rich he sends empty away. There's something about being poor in spirit and recognizing your need and being in weakness and coming to the Lord that really puts you in the prime position for the gold to be revealed, the faith to abound to glory to him. And that's where you really taste his sweetness and his availability and his faithfulness. And you learn to love him. And it says you receive the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets inquired. We'll, we'll talk more about this. But uh, in verse 12, it says angels desire to look into these things. This salvation, this experience you're going through is interesting to the angels. Um because we walk by faith and that is something unique and I, I i did a message about this but i'll, I'll try to make it brief 
The angels see God face to face. They watched him create the universe. They see him on the throne in glory. And they do his bidding because they know who he is. We, on the other hand, were born in sin. We were born blind. And I like to say blindfolded. And then we come to believe the gospel, right? And that gospel brings us closer to, the, to God than any angel can go. The cherubim could surround the throne, but we are told to come near, and we're actually one with the one who sits on it. We're seated with him. We're closer to God than any angel. And God reveals aspects of his person to us that the angels will never know because they don't know heaviness, they don't know the temptation, they don't know the weakness, they don't know the frailty, they don't know the mortality. They don't know what it's like to be hungry and thirsty for righteousness and poor and needy, right? And to come to God. And, and therefore, there are attributes of God that we know that they don't. His compassion, his mercy, his love, the physician coming for the sick. You know, he came for the sinners, not the righteous. They can't, they don't understand that. I mean, they can see it, but they've never experienced it because they had no need of that side of God. There's a whole set of attributes that God's revealing and putting on display in front of the angels through us. It's a teaching to the church, to the angels. That's why Ephesians 3 says that the church, according to God's eternal purpose, is the display of the multifarious wisdom of God to the angels. The angels are watching and learning. They're sons of God too, you know. Uh... They're learning what? They're learning new things about God that they wouldn't know otherwise if we hadn't modeled these things out in front of them. And not only are we brought closer to God, and not only do we know things about him that are more intimate, we're brought into his heart in a way that they could never be, where he experiences our weaknesses and is touched the feeling of our infirmities and walks with us in our suffering and is identified with us and we with him. He became like us, you know, and we are in him. We're, we were dead with him and we're raised together with him. We're one with him. Yet, as I said, we're blindfolded. We don't see him. We have no idea what God, this God we know is. And we have no idea how deeply we know him. We know him as our very breath. We know him as the source of groaning within. You know, when you groan, when you feel dry, did you know that you wouldn't have felt that, even known what that is before you got saved? That is a spiritual feeling. Dryness, even the heaviness, is a spiritual feeling that only a saved person really feels. This dryness, this hunger and thirst for God is really what it is. It's a hunger and thirst for Him. And it's because we've tasted that He's gracious. We've tasted that He's our source. We've tasted that only He can satisfy and when we're brought into heaviness, what, what it is is that we lack that taste. You know, where is my refreshing? Well, it's because we know that refreshing. And so we cry out to him. That came from him. And not only that, but it's because we have the first fruits of the Spirit, according to Romans 8, that we groan within ourselves. And he's groaning with us. It's the Spirit of son, the Sonship groaning in us, the first fruits of the Spirit. That, uh, that comes from Christ's he heavenly ministry, his high priesthood. It's the spirit in us interceding. See, you don't feel dry at first. You're just going through your thing and you're just like, eh, watching TV. And I'm, I'm not. You're not even thinking about the fact that you're not really hungry for God. But after a little while, you start to go, man, I'm hungry. That is his response to your weakness in the flesh. His intercession, his high priesthood. He's groaning within you, and then you groan. And that's something where we are experiencing Christ all the time, and we don't even know it, right? But the angels can see it. We, we are blindfolded, and we don't know what's going on. We're clueless, and they're like, they know God more than we do. <laughs> they know his heart in a way that we can't understand. And even though they haven't seen him, they love him. Even though they haven't seen him, they rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory as they believe. And they receive a, something called the salvation of their souls. Angels don't know that, you know. Uh, so it's really deep what we have. 
we should treasure it because one day we will see him face to face. And I think that we will always, I, I believe we'll remember this life like a dream, you know. I think the scripture says that somewhere. It'll just be like a foggy memory. But there'll be this sense that there was a preciousness to this time that'll never be available again. Because we'll see him face to face. We'll never know weakness again. We'll never know the, the way God values this time of look how precious it is. They come to me and they don't even, they, they don't even know what they have, how great what they have is. The angels know, but they've never seen it. They've never seen the glory that I'm teaching them to hunger and thirst for. And yet they want it. And as they taste it, they rejoice. That is something special to God that's only available in this season of mortality, you know. So and this is just my meditation, but, um, you know, this heaviness comes and it's all of Christ. These various temptations, sometimes they have to come. They are not to prove whether you have faith. They are to prove to you and to the angels that the faith you've received is more precious than gold that perishes and it's incorruptible. And it will abound to praise and honor and glory. When it's pressed, it springs up. That faith is Christ as life. He is the resurrection. And he's conquered everything. And he conquers everything in us. But he does it in such a gentle way. Because we're just clay vessels. You know, we're still in our weakness. So we couldn't take it if he were to just explode on us. <laughs> he does it in a very refined way. You know, God's power... We think of him in terms of he threw, flung forth the universe with the word of his power and, he, and there's black holes and suns and stars, you know, and infinite power locked up in the atom. Uh, power, 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 you know. But with us, he works like an artist, not a strong man. And he uses a delicate touch and it's very refined and detailed. And it's, yet it's the same power. It's resurrection. Resurrection is, is very powerful, and yet God can work with it in a really detailed way. While you feel nothing but weakness, yet he's actually working in you by life. Uh, and again, you, if you've had these kind of experiences, you know something of the Lord that angels can't even know. And it's just worth treasuring. It's worth saying, you know, thank you, Lord. I appreciate the experiences. You know, I didn't know what dryness was until I tasted you. Thank you for giving me that taste. Now I'm hungry and thirsty for you again. And I believe that's you operating in me to make me sensitive to the fact that I'm weak and I need you. And that's because you make me sensitive and you make me hungry and thirsty so that you can fill me. He brings you into the season so that he can fill you. And every time he does, he fills you more. You will come out with a greater appreciation of Christ. And it's like a cycle. On the one hand, it's your faith will be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's an absolute thing when you see him. But in our life, the way he works is he brings you into this season where your weakness brought you into dryness. And then he makes you sensible to it by groaning within you. And then the way he answers that hunger and thirst is by revealing more of himself to you. It's always based on some acknowledgement of the truth in Christ that brings you back to him and brings you back into appreciation, which is the salvation of your soul. You know, what Paul was experiencing in Philippi, he's overflowing with joy. He says, even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice in your service of your faith, I rejoice and I joy with you all. He is full of joy. Why? Because he's experiencing the salvation of his soul. That's what we're looking at. The magnification of Christ in us is the salvation of our soul to bring us into a rejoicing that is unspeakable and full of glory, even though we don't see him. So it's for now. On the one hand, it's for then when we do see him, see him. But on the other hand, it's for now when we don't. And angels marvel when we have this kind of experience. And this is, you know, in some point in Peter's letter, he says, if indeed you've tasted that the Lord is good or that he's gracious, have you tasted this? 
You know, I really am concerned when I do meet Christians who seem to have never tasted the goodness of God. You know, they've got no sense of this, the, uh, the, that they've ever drank from the fountain. There's just a dryness. doesn't mean they're not saved. Uh, and I'm not talking about spiritual experiences per se, like the charismatics. I'm saying, has there ever been a thing where your heart responded in love to the Lord based on what you've seen of him? Something in you said, oh, Lord, thank you. Well, he wants to deepen that. And sometimes he has to bring us through trials that are designed to break down the fallow ground of our heart. Our heart can be very hard and callous deceit, through the deceitfulness of sin, through the traffic of this world, our thorny heart with the cares of this world, the anxieties of this age and our life and our, what, our worries about our spiritual growth even. All of that hardens your heart and makes you insensitive to the feelings of the groaning and the life. So you don't even know you're dry, you know. Only someone who's really tasted that God is gracious even knows they're dry. Uh, but then he wants to fill it. But, you know, like I said in my Schaefer study last night, I used to have such a hard heart through re religiosity and unbelief and cares and anxieties, you know, that it was hard for me to perceive when the Lord was touching me. But it is easier for him now, I think, with me. Because he had to, he brought me through so much failure and defeat that I finally stopped depending on myself and measuring everything by my experiences and started learning to approve that which is excellent, approve what Christ is doing by faith as it's described in the word. And even in my dryness say, no, I believe in Jesus Christ. There's no condemnation. So that feeling cannot be the way I measure myself. I measure myself by the word, which says I'm qualified for a share of the allotted portion of the saints in the light. And I've been brought near through the blood of Christ and Christ himself is my peace. This is why I emphasize preach the gospel to yourself. That's my terms for encourage yourself in the Lord or come forward on the basis of faith or believe, you know, the work of faith is to believe. We got to believe and exercise our faith uh, and bring ourselves into the presence of God and fan ourselves into flame. And yet what we find is everything that brings us to that point is the Lord's work. And that's one of the reasons we love him. Over time, we start to see how faithful he's been in our life and how much he was a part of everything where, that we used to even condemn ourselves about. Our failures and our weakness and our collapse and our checkmate and how we seem to blow it and ruin it for everything and there was just no hope for us to go on and we spent years wallowing in our misery. That was all designed by the Lord to bring you to an end of yourself so that you could be the kind of person who's very easy to touch, soft. That's what he's looking for. He's wanting soft-hearted, meek, hungry and thirsty people that delight in his presence and recognize it when it's moving, when, when he's touching them. You know, he really wants an intimacy with you, but he's got to break through a lot of hardness in our hearts. And he knows how, but we got to give him time. So that's why the manifold temptations and, and testing comes. It's not even that he just wants to glorify his faith and show how great it is. No, he, what he wants is to find you rejoicing in him. He wants the salvation of your soul. He wants you to know the joy unspeakable, full of glory. Like John said, we write these things to you that you may have fellowship with us. Truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we write these things to you that your joy may be full. Period. That's what God wants, believe it or not. And uh, no, he's not Santa Claus or something. He doesn't, it's not, we're not talking about happiness. We're talking about a deeper thing. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Uh, all right, I'm done. I'll talk to you later.